<laughs> All right, so unit vectors, what does the word unit mean? One. One. Oh, very good. <laughs> it's impressive. So vectors, the property we're talking about that is one is the length. So unit vectors are all vectors who have a length of one. You can turn any vector into a, almost any vector into a unit vector. Turning a vector into a unit vector is called normalizing. And the way you normalize, if you have vector v and you want to normalize it, you divide by its own magnitude. So if your vector is really small, let's say your vector is one tenth of a unit long, then to normalize it, you would make it 10 times longer. You'd be dividing by its length. If your vector is really big, maybe it's a vector from here to the moon, and you want it to be one foot long instead of one whatever number of feet that would be a lot, you would divide it by its magnitude. So you'd make it whatever, 10 million times smaller, or whatever distance to the moon is. So that is normalizing. What kind of a vector could not be normalized? Zero vector. So zero vector, you'd be divided by zero. So it doesn't make sense to have a unit vector in a direction when there is no direction. So zero vector is the only one that won't or can't be normalized. So that'll be true when magnitude v is not zero. So that's how we normalize a vector. And now parallel vectors. So let me draw two parallel vectors. Pretend those are actually straight. So they're supposed to go the same direction. They don't have to be so similar in magnitude. You can have a really short vector going there and a really long vector pointed the same direction. And they still be parallel. So we know they're parallel if there exists an alpha greater than 0 such that alpha u equals v. So if they are positive scalar multiples of each other, they're parallel. Now, the way I wrote it, a u e or alpha u equals v. Well, I could move the scalar to the other side pretty easily. U equals 1 over alpha times v. And that would be the same thing. And as long as alpha is not 0 or is strictly positive, then it doesn't matter what side you put the multiple on. You can move it to the other side with its reciprocal. So those are parallel vectors. Do you also have like alpha v equals v? Yep. It doesn't. It didn't matter what side to put the alpha on. But then it'd be backwards as it might be would equal one over alpha. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what side you put the scalar on. It would just be the reciprocal. But it's, the point is, it would still be positive and not zero. So those are parallel. Now anti-parallel. So that is the opposite of parallel, meaning you have one vector going one direction, and another vector going the opposite or anti-direction. U and V are anti-parallel. If there exists, so what is different about this alpha? This one has to be negative, meaning it's going to turn the vector the opposite way. So if there is a negative alpha <coughs> such that alpha U equals V. And same reasons as before, I can move the alpha to the other side very easily as a 1 over alpha. So that's parallel and anti-parallel. What about perpendicular? 
Oh, it's a good question. I can't tell you about perpendicular with the tools that we have okay. yet, but we'll see them very soon. <clears throat> now, just because you're not parallel and not anti-parallel, there's you doesn't mean you're perpendicular. There's an infinite number of angles in between that you can be. These are kind of the two extremes. Uh, parallel would be halfway in between these two, or not perpendicular would be halfway between these two. So I want to find a unit vector in the direction of 2, 2, negative 1. So what this means, I want to find a vector that's parallel that has length 1. So again, it's usually a waste of time to try to carefully graph out in three dimensions. Because whatever you draw, you're drawing on a two-dimensional plane. So it's most likely not going to give you a huge amount of insight. So I'm not going to bother graphing any of this. What do I have to do with this vector? Let's call this vector v. What do I have to do with a vector v to find a unit vector? Get its magnitude divided by Yep, so find its magnitude. It's definitely not going to be 0. We so the only type vector that's going to be a zero magnitude is zero vector. So you should see instantly it's not going to be the zero vector. So find the magnitude, and then our vector u is v over magnitude v. So get magnitude and divide by it. It does not matter which of these two forms that you write your unit vector in. It doesn't matter to me if you distribute your scalar or not. <coughs> Web work probably wants the one on the right side more so than the one on the left. But depending on the Web work question, they may take either one. So the first thing I showed you in pre-calculus 1, way, way, way back, was midpoint. How did we get midpoint? We took Just average two points together. The beginning and then divided by two. Well, if you do n minus beginning, you'll have half the difference between them. Not You need to add them together okay. and cut them in half. So our midpoint, uh, we use letter m. Uh, midpoint of two other points of uh, two points we'll call them uh, point one and point two p1 and p2 and we'll call the midpoint m so m is going to be p1 plus p2 divided by two it's the average of the points If we look a little bit more carefully, if we're in three dimensions, our midpoint will be x1 plus x2 over 2. That's our x coordinate. Our y coordinate will be averaging the y values, and our z coordinate will average the z values. So I don't think it's worth doing an example problem on midpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Let's work on some word problems. So jet is flying east at 500 miles per hour airspeed. There's a 70 mile per hour wind 
flowing sixty degrees uh, north of east. Find the ground speed. So we have a jet is flying directly east really quickly. So this is an overhead view, and that's the velocity of our jet flying east. So let's go with VJ or VA for aircraft. I'll go VJ for the jet. Uh oh, wind. Let's do VA. So I don't want to think about jet stream. So VA, that would be the velocity of the aircraft. So it's air velocity of the aircraft. Real quick, mm -hmm. going back to the anti-parallel, that could be used in dealing with a problem similar to this if we were trying to calculate the opposing forces. Because the well, wind would oppose the... The wind will slow the aircraft down in the direction. You'll see in a minute. These are not quite anti-parallel, though. Okay. They're actually, well, they're kind of diagonal to each other. So our wind is blowing 6 degrees north of east. So if I line up my axis right here, our wind's blowing 6 degrees north. It's not blowing nearly as fast as the aircraft's going, so it's a much shorter arrow. And we'll call this velocity of the VW, velocity of the wind. So is the wind helping the air aircraft move a little faster, or is it working against it, making it move a little slower? Move a little faster. So what I want to do next is figure out what's the total effect or what's the ground speed of this airplane. So the ground speed, according to intuition, should be a little faster than 500. The wind is actually, it's not quite a tailwind. A tailwind would be parallel. So if it was a regular tailwind, I can just add the two together. But, or not add the two, but add the two horizontal components together. So it turns out I do need to add these two vectors together. And the way we're going to do it is called head to tail. So all addition of vectors is head to tail. So what we do is take a copy of one of the vectors and rewrite it so it appears to start um, at the beginning of the first vector. So I moved VW over. So that's VW. And connect these together with an arrow. This is VA plus VW. So you're just going to one vector and then the other vector. Now, a while back, I showed you, I think that was just yesterday, we saw that addition was commutative. Or at least I told you addition was commutative with all the properties. So it shouldn't matter the order I add them in. So let's go ahead and, and apply this in the other order. So I'm going to take a copy of VA. So I'm taking a copy of this bottom vector, and I'm going to start it at the end of VW. So I'm going to start at the end of VW, and then I'm going to put a copy of VA down. And you should be able to tell that we are at the exact same point. Doesn't matter which of the two ways you got there. And the same X and the same Z. Uh, this is a 
It's as many dimensions as you want. I kind of drew, drew it like it was two. This problem is two dimensions, but uh, in general, it's worse any dimension. The only thing that is you need three dimensions for is a cross product. So that's the only thing I'm showing you, or that I will show you that needs three dimensions. So everything else I'm showing you, generally, we're going to work in two or three dimensions. All right, so this sum, VA plus VW, is the ground velocity. So I want to find what is VA plus VW. That's our total velocity. Oh, we didn't even write down what VA or VW was. All right, let's do the easy one. What are the coordinates of VA? So 500 to the right and 0 up. That one was easy. Ooh, VW. It's going to have a little right and a little up. So VW, we need to use polar coordinates. So I know that the magnitude or the length is 70. So that's part of it. And now I want a unit vector in the direction of 60 degrees. So let's digress into polar coordinates for a minute. <coughs> so let's take a trip back through pre-calculus 2. So in Cartesian, I would label this as xy. In polar coordinates, this would have a slightly different way of looking at it. x is r cos theta, y is r sine theta. We saw that right back in polar coordinates. So that should not be new or surprising. The only thing I'm going to do here is factor an r out, which we call scalar multiplication. You could call this scalar factoring, but I'm just using the scalar multiplication property here. So I've seen R and R, so I can factor that out. So the best way to think about a polar vector is a length and a unit vector in the direction. So that's the way to think about polars. So we're going to use that idea for VW. So our length or magnitude is 70, and then we have cos 60 sine 60. And we should go ahead and figure out what this actually is. So don't forget your cosine sine values. Cos is 1 half, and sine is square root 3 halves. Distribute, we got 35, and 35 square root 3. So how come uh, VA wasn't in polar, or was it? Uh, what's that? How come like, we only did VW in polar? Because VA was easy enough that I didn't need to. I could absolutely go to polar. So the magnitude is 500. And what's the direction on VA in uh, degrees? So we'll go 0 degrees, because that's directly to the right. Yep. It was basically too easy. So if I, if I have a vector that's going along an axis, one of the four axes, I would just normally write it out. If it's halfway in between, you might be able to do it in your head. But as soon as you get a an angle that's not nice, you pretty much need to do this. All right, so we just add those two together. So we're adding up those two vectors. There's really not so much to do. So we're going to get 500 plus 35. So that's 535. And then 0 plus 35 square root. 3 is 35 square root 3. So 
So there's our total velocity. It's just ze or zero plus the second. Yeah. So our next, which will be also the last problem of this section, we're going to look at tensions in two wires suspended from the ceiling. Is Newton a mass or weight? It's, a it's an apple. It's an apple. <laughs> yeah. It's a force. an apple. Oh, dude. So we'll suspend a disco ball. It is suspended by two wires. I think they just had a, some football game in the last year that one of their cameras suspended on two wires broke and like crashed into the crowd. Does anybody watching sports remember that? Yeah, yeah, they have at big sporting events they have these huge wires set up, two wires, and they put a little camera in between and it can run around on them, which is kind of like this problem, a little bit more complicated, but. Isn't that how a 3D printer works? Yeah, yeah, but it's not suspended on wire. It's on like solid beams. Uh, anyways, two wires. Well, hopefully our ball won't break and hit somebody in the head. That'd be bad. Two wires. That's why we're computing things first. Or the ankle. <laughs> or the ankle. Uh, one wire is making a 45 degree angle with the ceiling. The other wire is making a 30 degree angle with the ceiling. find the magnitude of forces in both wires. So let's draw a picture. So here's our disco ball, which pretty much everything you draw in physics looks just like a point. Two wires I draw at 45, which one I draw at 30. If I okay. So I'll just go ahead and put our 45 right there. And we'll put our 30 degree wire over there. So this is our setup. And those are the 35 and 40 degree. What about 75 newtons? What does that describe in our diagram? Force flowing down on that point. On that point. So at this point, there is a force. Let's do forces in blue. So there's a force pulling directly <coughs> downwards. <coughs> force is red. Is that why yeah. you were upset? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I've seen a lot of red forces in Washington State, for sure. Definitely. <laughs> Sorry, California forces are blue. All right. Well, there's some other forces. Let's give this force a name. What is a good name for this one? F1. How about FG? F1 would have been reasonable too, but I'm going to go G for gravity. All right. These wires need to have some force on them. So one wire is pulling directly. The 
direction it's going, and the other wire is going to be pulling exactly the direction it's going. Now there is an assumption we make on this problem in physics. What's the unwritten assumption? <laughs> Just saying stuff. Uh, we assume that the wires weigh nothing. So we assume that the wires weigh nothing per foot, weigh zero per foot. So if you imagine, if this wire was uh, 20 miles long, at that point, at some point, it wouldn't matter so much the weight of the disco ball, because your wire would be like 20,000 tons or something. So we assume on these problems that our wire weighs zero. And that's not terribly realistic. It's OK if the wire is short, but the longer the wire is, you have to account for that. Uh, you can take care of that by carefully integrating up the wire, which is a more complicated physics. You've probably done something like that or not. Uh, I'm not terribly good at physics, but that's why we keep it easy in this class. So we're just going to pretend like the wires don't weigh anything. So very futuristic. So let's call them F1 and F2. So there's a very fancy phrase for this. When things are not moving, we call it static equilibrium. So this is not a situation that's not moving. So static equilibrium. What color is acceleration? Green. What's blue? Velocity. Oh, of course. All right, so what does static equilibrium mean? We add up all the forces and get zero. Now, what type of zero is that? I'm adding up vectors. Zero vector. It better be the zero vector. If you're adding vectors, you get a number, or something went horribly wrong. So this should be the zero vector over here. And we're ready to write down these vectors. Let's start with the easy one, fg. What is fg? A disco ball. What is a disco ball, but how much oh, force? So it'll be 0 left and right, and then 75 downwards. So I need to make sure it's negative 75, or else gravity would pull this up through the ceiling. How about F1? What do I know about F1? Do I know the actual tension or force in the? Uh, just the angle. All I know is the angle. So I don't know the tension. So let's call it T1 for tension 1 times what is the unit vector in that direction? Cos, sine 45. So let's try cos 45, sine 45. Now that 45 degree angle I labeled is not measured in a regular way. So let's draw 45 degrees measured in the regular way. What color are angles? Black. I've used that too much. I'm going to go purple. All right, so you agree that's 45 degrees? And is that measured in the, that's measured in the normal way, from positive x to where we're going? OK, so 45 degrees is the right angle to use. Let's move on to second force. So it starts out the same. So F2, I don't know the tension, so we'll go T2. Now the angle, we got to be careful with that angle. Let's look at the angle. How should I be measuring the angle? I've already drawn the x-axis, the positive x-axis. That's not a 30 degree angle. So it'll be 180 minus 30, or complementary angles. There's a few ways to think about it. This was hopefully your geometry class in high school convinced you of these relationships that I'm not going to talk much about. Can't we just uh, flip cosine and sine? Well, so what will really happen is the difference between this and regular 30 degrees is your x coordinates negative, basically. So in this particular case, you. I recommend you just write the correct angle down, measure it the right way. 
So we, uh, we got 90 minus 30, which is 150. Uh, if you like reference angles, you can absolutely write down this 30 degrees is theta bar, if you want to go back to reference angles. So you did get the reference angle, but that was not the angle we wanted. We had to decide which one was positive and negative. That's how reference angles are related to uh, the regular angles. What does the bar mean again? Uh, you talked about it in basic Well, it depends, on who you, it depends on who's writing what the bar means. I used it for reference angles. It's also used for the conjugate. It's also used for our average. Depends on who writes it and in what context. Okay. So right now it means reference angle. So 150 is what we're going to use. We do know cos and sine of 45 are 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2. Those are easy. Cos 150 is negative square root of 3 over 2. And sine 150 is 1 half. OK, add these three together and set that sum equal to 0. To do this, I also need to distribute my tensions inside. So it'll be T1 over square root 2, T1 over square root 2, and my second force, negative square root 3, T1 over 2, and T1 over 2. I know my zero vector is in two dimensions, so I'll write out the zero, zero on that. How in the world did we figure out T1 and T2? System of equations. So we're actually looking at two equations, even though it looks like one. It's a two dimensional equation. So there's an x equation and a y equation. So we're going to write the x equation and the y equation. So the x equation is the first coordinate equation. And then the y equation is the second coordinate equation. So x equation is 0 plus t1 over square root 2 minus square root 3 t2 over 2 equals 0. Our y equation is negative 75 plus t1 over square root 2. Uh oh, something's wrong. I should not have so many T1s in here. Those guys should be T2. Okay, solve for T1 and T2. So two equations, two unknowns. These are actually a really easy type of system. What is the name of this type of system? You can solve it with the matrix. So it's linear. So our t1 and t2 are not squared, square rooted. They're just constant multiple t1 plus a constant multiple t2 plus constant equals 0. So this is a linear system. So fractions suck. It's a good first move to multiply by 2 square root 2. And you'll get out of fraction land pretty quickly. And after that, pretty much whatever you want to do. Elimination, substitution, either one should work pretty well.
These are not difficult system. All right, so solve on your own. I think this is a good place to end. We just finished a section. Don't want to start a new one with three minutes left. <laughs>